fact that I am the first for something in Barry Graham's incredible career. It might be a first Skype call, but I can at least say I'm on poll for this one. Barry Graham, it's good to catch up with you. A pleasure, Wade. It's crazy times at the moment, Barry. Um, you're locked down in... I kind of wish I was locked down where you're locked down because I reckon there's plenty of things to do. But um, how, how is everything going for your beautiful family and, and tell everybody where you are? Yeah, no, well, we're fortunate to be on 250 acres in the Southern Highlands, Barrel. Um, we've got a kilometre of riverfront where we can go and do a bit of fishing, even though they are only carp, but they're a bit of fun. Yep. yep. Um, and I got the Legends cars out the other day and had a bit of a burn around the racetrack just Soon I couldn't go and play with my BMW, so um, no, we're, we're not doing it too tough. That, when you said your racetrack, is that Liverpool? Is that the mini Liverpool that you race around? Yes, yep. So can you explain? Let, I've got so many things I want to talk to you about, Barry, because we're, we're probably going to do this in three different interviews because I want to talk about your own motorsport passion. I want to talk about Steve's um, and, of course, your property, and, and then, of course, the Richard Petty driving experience, because that's such a huge part of, of everything that you did later in life. Um, so struggle. I'm going to struggle to stay on the one subject. You've got so much great stuff to talk about. And over your shoulder, I love the wall. Are you in your office or your lounge room, or where are you right now? No, we're, it's been many years since you've been here, Wade. This, this is sort of the um, entertainment side of the shed, as we call it. You know, the race cars are on the other side. This is where we have morning tea. And um, over the years, more Stephen than myself sort of try to set up a, a bit of a, um, a timeline of the cars that I raced over the years on the wall behind me. So it sort of starts in the, the early um, Amaru Park road racing, which I'd done hill climbs and lap dashes and all that back in the, the 60s and then went to the Speedway. And so it's a bit of a, a timeline of um, my motorsport career, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get into that, tell me um, who the family are. You know, tell me how um, your son and your daughter and their respective um, husbands and wives and your grandchildren, how the Graham family tree has evolved. Well... It all evolved through the American um, adventure <laughs> that um, once I sort of got that up and running, I, you know, and you've probably been around us a lot of years, I'm a bit of a family man at heart. And yep. um, being away from the family didn't go down that good with my wife and myself. We thought we'd be there for a, you know, a short period of time with our idea and... Um, it turned out to be a 20-plus years experience. So, you know, once we got the business into a position where I knew I could afford to get the family involved and give them an income, we got, you know, Stephen and his girlfriend at that time and my daughter Amanda that lived in the West and yeah. her husband Craig and... Min, who you know was only a schoolgirl at that stage, to um, come to America and we set up that ASM digital. And then my vision was once we made some money, that when we come home, I wanted some place for us all to be as a family because we all shared in the success of, of yep. building that business. So, hence the, the 250 acres with the sort of family living on it. Yeah, yeah. So, who's there? There's Stephen, Kerry, and yep. their three children, which is the youngest, is Zach, and um, well, then Harrison and Brianna. They're all born in America. They're all yeah, they're American, right. Americans. Yep. Um, daughter Amanda, um, her two boys. Um, we've got you know, my wife and myself, and Min's the only one that we could never coach and do um, farm life. He, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think as she gets older, she spends a little more time here. So the day will come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she, of course, she married a bloody road racer. How on earth did you let that happen? Well, I tried to keep her away from the, the races uh, <laughs> from the start, but 
it's a bit hard when that's all that your family ever know, you know, and knew and done, is uh, go racing. So it was inevitable that um, a racer would come into her life. Yeah, absolutely. And he's a lovely guy, absolutely a champion, very handy racer and a, and a lovely bloke too, Surly. Um, I did ask you one thing. I said you, you had you got one job, Barry, to wear what during this interview, and and what is? Oh, thank goodness. There you go. <laughs> now I know I'm talking to Barry Graham. <laughs> I, I was just checking. I was just checking your memory. Oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> I, I remember vividly you wearing it at Claremont Speedway in the pits at Claremont. That's one of my, you know, my my first memories of you know you being over there and. Uh, over there with Stephen, and then of course, you guys ran the, the indoor show at Burswood as well. And as I said, this is going to be hard to stay on topic. Let's get back to you. Did anybody race in your family before you? Where did this motor racing passion come from? Yeah, my father was a motor, motorcycle racer through the um, well, the start of motor racing or motor bike racing in Australia in the 20s, uh, up into the early 30s. Um, you know, we raced at Maitland in the early days of the solos and Sydney yeah, Showground yeah. and um, went to New Zealand, broke his leg, so he missed out on the first trip with Lionel Van Prague to England. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, I was given the injection pretty early in life of um, yeah. motorsport because... We had a sort of five-acre parcel of land at Bankstown. The neighbours, you know, the whole sort of street was, you know, half a dozen houses all with a five-acre lot. That the backs or the backyards all run into each other. So, yep. you know, my father carved out tracks for me and I rode the bikes and then he built me hot rods and then... As I got older, you know, we went go kart racing, and so it was inevitable. Um, yeah, <laughs> but in, in all that time, my father worked at home as a motor mechanic, auto electrician. We had a little shop there with a lathe and machinery, which I learnt to use. And um, you know, if I would only have it today, he had a few old Douglas motorbikes from his racing career which I'd pull apart and put together and see me bits I had left over until I could get it <laughs> done get it done right. Um, you know, so it was a I you know served my apprenticeship in doing that and um, and that helped me, you know, in those days, you know, at the age of fourteen and nine months school wasn't the place where I wanted to be. Um, but with my background I was fortunate enough to get an apprenticeship with Qantas and, mm -hmm. yeah. and that sort of refined anything that I'd already learned as far as mechanical skills um, to be in the aircraft industry. You have to be a little um, sharper on your yep. presentation yep. and your, your diligence and the work that you do. And, you know, I was fortunate then to be able to put that into the race car, you know, um, side of you, things. Stephen? Is that why Stephen went towards the aviation side of things, working for the airline industry as well in the early days? Um, 100%. You know, that the experiences that, that you could gain there um, and the way to go about your work, you know, I think shows in the way that he builds his race cars. And, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's pretty obvious that someone's taught him something <laughs> besides his father. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's an incredible, um, Barry, when you think back in those days when you just walked out of school at 14 years and nine months. I was reading the other day that last week would have been uh, Sir Jack Brabham's 94th birthday. And he followed a very similar path. Or at least he, he wanted to be a, a fighter pilot in the in the RAF, but he ended up being, an, um, I think it was an aircraft mechanic. And he left at 15 or something and then joined the Air Force at 18, etc., is it even possible for kids in this era to, to walk out of school at 15 and do that kind of thing? It seems a lot harder to do these days. Oh, it does. And I don't think the opportunities. See, Qantas in those days, and I wasn't aware of this because I thought I was leaving school to go to work, um, they run their own tech school. 
So right. when you were, when you were employed, I went back to school, but at least the there was an interest in what I was learning. Where at school, a lot of the stuff, you know, um, as years have gone on, I say to myself and give myself a slap across the back of the head. I wish I'd have paid more attention because I never <laughs> thought I'd end up in you know the situation I did in America of having so many hundred employees and yeah. you know, the, the business side of things when you're only a somewhat a dumbass, you know, <laughs> race car driver mechanic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So where, what was the first thing you raced? Like you, were you lined up alongside someone else? Um, oh, probably go-karts. Um you know, at, at a place called Ludnam, which was yeah. sort of out the back of Liverpool area. Yeah. Um, my father would take me out there and go kart racing at probably 12 or something. You know, I wasn't that, when I say that young, but at that time I'd had plenty of experience at skidding around the backyard. So. Yeah. It wasn't anything really new, only, as you said, lining up against somebody else, you know, and um, I really can't recall those days to any great, you know, it wasn't something that, that I thought would lead me to the career that it did. Yeah. It's funny, when I think of Ludnam, I think that Terry King raced his tether cars um, out there a, a fair bit, that sort of area, because Terry's into his tether cars. And um, yeah. I think he once told me that they raced him out at Ludnam. So go-karts obviously on, on dirt then, or bitumen? On dirt. Well, it was oil, oil dirt, you know. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, the similar, you know, the, uh, the rules of um, quite not what they are now where you get a 44 of uh, some oil and pour over the racetrack. And... <laughs> <laughs> so how long did you do carts for? Uh, probably only a couple of years, I think, Wade. That, um, you know, that sort of, in all that time, I still played with, you know, my own cars and when I say own cars, things that the dad had bought and that we could modify and, you know, like um, I had a thing called an SS Jaguar, which today would be worth a squeeze. We turfed the engine out of that and put a side valve forward Mercury engine because the Jaguar engine didn't rev up and spin the wheels and, you know. Wow. So... You know, I'd done probably more, and and I had a great interest in in sort of working and building the cars. Um, and then I, you know, in late sixties that I started the road racing adventure of um, only because of the road car that I had was I bought a XR GD Falcon in sixty eight. And you could, um, you could, you know, go to Oran Park or Amaru or Silverdale yeah. Hill Climb and you know, have a bit of fun. And I think it, it was a great learning because, you know, we got married young. We're only 19. Stephen and Amanda come along. They'd be on the back floor of the Falcon and off we'd go and, you know, turf them out on the hill and go and do a few laps and then pack up and come home. And so you couldn't afford to crash it. I never even thought of it, you know, what would happen. How you get home. <laughs> yeah, that, those things didn't come into play. Most important thing was that you remember to take the kids out before you went onto the track, man. I think that's, forget the ride home, at least you got the kids out and K out, right? <laughs> yeah. It's incredible um, that Steve has followed a very similar line there with you because you spent those really formative years with your dad learning, you know, with him that that attention to detail and how race cars worked and things like that. And Stephen absolutely is a, a he's probably the youngest professor I know. Like he has a, an incredible reputation for his attention to detail and making things just right. And you never see a GRD car pull out of a race. 
So that has followed down the line. I think that's an incredible legacy that you that your your dad started. Yes, yeah, well, you know, and, and that's what the driving side of it, you know, I've become quite fond of later. But the the something my father pressed upon me was that, you know, preparation is everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, you mightn't be AJ Foyt, but if your car preparation's better than the next guy's, you'll usually finish ahead of him anyway. So, you know, it's sort of something that Stephen seen happen through my career and we're fortunate enough that my father was still alive in Stephen's um, go-karting in early days of midget racing and um, him and my mother lived, lived with us. So they, they were part of the, you know, part of the going racing. I think um, the passion that Steve has for that engineering side of it and for the building and all that stuff that you talk about, it probably helped him a little bit to transition into being an owner rather than a racer after the crash when he was, you know, his racing driving duties were sort of curtailed. At least he had that passion already for it. He wasn't like a, and I say this with respect, like a Craig Brady who never really had that, that passion for the engineering side of it. If his racing career just stopped the driving, I'm not sure he would have gone on to do what Steven's done. So Coming down the line, that that passion for building and for wanting the performance from the car probably helps Stephen. I'm just guessing. Oh, there doesn't there doesn't a day go by that he's not trying to think of a better way to do things. You know, yeah. It, it, you know, and I know we're jumping around everywhere here, but you know, Sammy Swindell. Yeah. Is somewhat the same. You know, yeah. And once we met the Swindell family. It was like, um, you know, a marriage. Like, they loved us. We loved them because yeah. we're all so similar in what, what we were trying to achieve, you know. And probably as, you know, Kay and I used to get criticised a bit by Pearl, don't go and talk to Barry and Kay. They're, they're sort of a, a bit snobbish, you know. A lot of people would say that to us, but... I think because when we were at the racetrack, we were so focused on what what we what we were there for. Yeah. You know, and yeah. even even to today, somewhat that doesn't change. It, Kay gets quite annoyed when we go to the speedway and we'll go with a group of people, and all they want to do is talk. She wants to watch the racing. <laughs> <laughs> so let you're right. It'd be so hard not to digress. So you went from your carts. Where did you go from there? Well, as I said just working and building, you know, um, stuff to play with on the around yep. the backyard, and then from there to the the Falcon. Okay, so he went um, straight to the, the carts. Okay, yeah, after a couple yeah. of years. Yeah. Yeah, but the involvement, like um, where my mother and father lived, and they took in a, a border, and he was uh, actually a police officer that was a motor racing freak. Yep. He had an FJ Holden and we'd go to Bathurst with, we'd go to Oran Park and you know, I'd work on that car as I was, you know, I was going to race it, you know, and yep. Um, yep. it was another learning experience to, you know, work on a race car at a racetrack and, you know, I was probably only 13 or 14 years old, you know, would go to Warwick Farm. And so, you know, even though I didn't have the bug at driving, I did have the bug at, at motor racing. Most of us, Barry, have um, an allegiance one way or the other, dirt or bitumen, right? Most of us in the speedway world, we certainly go, road racing's good if I can't go to a dirt race. Um, and road racing guys go, yeah, dirt racing's good if I can't go to a road race. Yet you seem to have a balance of both. Were you going to the Sydney showground and those sort of places as a kid then as well? Or did you not have that dirt love? Yeah, um, not not regularly. The Actually, the Jeff Kerslake was the policeman's name. He, he'd take me to the Sydney showground um, and said probably... I did have an interest in it. Then I got a greater interest in it when I started at Qantas 
because if you look at the date, the timeline, that was just when Jeff Freeman was killed. Oh, wow. And, and Sir Eric Kidd had the car at Qantas doing the, the, the rebuild on it. Wow. Um, and, you know, I had an interest, but I can't say that I was really, you know, crazy in, in love with the, with the midgets, you know. Um, that didn't come until the asphalt when I thought I had to have a piece of this action. And I guess that's probably why the asphalt stuff at Liverpool made sense to you because it probably married two of your loves. It? It, it married your love of black track together with oval racing. So it was probably the perfect fit for you. Yeah, well, I, I raced at Liverpool when it was dirt. Um, a friend of mine, well, a lifelong friend named John Gale, he and Gordon Smee, they were racing at um, Liverpool in FE, FC Holdens. Um, and then, you know, we all sort of grew up in Bankstown, so maybe a little illegal street racing had something to do with it all. But um, John and I teamed up with a, another guy that didn't have the sort of... John was a panel boot by trade, yep. me being some sort of race car fanatic. Um, and... This guy sort of, he knew us and said, you know, well, hey, can you help me tidy this car up? And so we did that. And then in return, he said, well, I think you and John should drive it. So my first um, Speedway outings, we were in an XU1 Tirana, probably uh, early 70s. Um, I didn't mind it, um, but I wasn't again in totally in love with it you know and um but then when the the asphalt concept come along john and i said well you know we'll build ourselves a yeah an asphalt hot rod which we built a supercharged monaro and um that was a the greatest trying times that you know i thought that the power of a supercharged 327 Chev was going to be the be all to end all, and uh, it near ended all because I couldn't keep the thing together. And uh, eventually, we you know turfed the supercharger and went to normally aspirated, and figured that if you go around the corners as fast as you went around the straightaway. Yep. Things were going to get good, so we we started winning races. So um, it was a it was quite a a learning experience. <laughs> so you started off in a in a GT doing your hill climb and you know driving on the weekends with the family and then doing some occasional racing, and then you went into a bloody Tirana and a Monaro. What happened, Barry? You're on the way to the right path, and then you suddenly just veered off, and you went the Holden. <laughs> yeah, well. In those days, I don't think it, it it didn't matter to me, and it still doesn't. What what bad show, even though you like to wind other people up, you know. Um, like Wade, when we first met, if you were telling me I was racing a BMW, I'd tell you to go away. Like, <laughs> yes, I still do. <laughs> So from there, the Liverpool stuff. Um, obviously, were you still doing your black track sort of circuit stuff at the same time? Yes, yeah, d doing sort of um, days at well, Amaru and Oran Park mainly. Um, they were sort of not not racing against uh, against the clock, like um, you know, Black Dash, they were called. Yep. Um, yep. Time attack these days. Yeah, that, that's the modern. Uh, yeah. The cars, are, the cars are a little different. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it, when you think about Amaru, for example. And as a kid, I remember Mike Raymond. It's, that was my exposure to those circuits was Mike Raymond, you know, announcing and guys like, um, uh, I'm thinking, um, I should even remember his name, John Smales and Will Hagen and those kind of guys, you know, on Channel 2 was my experience with Amaru. And, of course, Max Dumsney lives at the bottom of the basin there of Amaru Park these days. And I got to commentate at Oran Park. They were phenomenal charismatic circuits, weren't they? Oh, they were just, you know, 
Amaru was such a place because it was a natural amphitheater. You know, no grandstands. You know, people on the hill. Yeah. Close to the action. You know, and that that's sort of a a bit of a struggle. I think that you'd agree with me with Speedway and somewhat road racing these days. You you're too far away from the action. You know, where you know I take the the family and sit them up above the stop go corner there. <laughs> Amaru, and yeah. you know you could you could see all the action, you know, and it, it, you know I can't say it was my favourite racetrack. This is you know in years gone on when I was road racing with Brian Callahan, and then we'd do the the long distance races at Amaru, and um, but it it was it was just had an atmosphere about it. The, um, when I think about the stuff, I think some great photos that, you know, you've got, you've got some on the on the wall just there. Of, I can see the Tirana in the background, I reckon. I can see a Commodore. It looks like you're running like a VL or something at Bathurst. I can see a Grand National car over your shoulder and the speed car as well. I would have thought with the technology that you love with shock um, technology and suspension work and stuff like that, that late models would have been on your radar a little bit in later years, particularly with Stephen and, and the way his brain works. You're still very much focused on the speed car stuff, yet that was only a small part of your life, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, and I really enjoyed the speed car side of things on the asphalt and dirt, yeah. much to a lot of people's, um, you know, don't, they see me as a sort of asphalt boy. Um, yeah. You know, I, you can't see it, but if I look at my vintage midget that I go and run at the vintage meetings, which I thoroughly enjoy because I still love skidding around the dirt. Yeah. Um, when, when Liverpool and the Grand Nationals went back to dirt, I can't say that I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, I, I like to have the presentation of the car, um, you know, look, looking... <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't want to... I didn't want to see the car after a night's dirt racing it. Uh, I, I just somewhat, and, and I'm serious, Wade, I, I lost the enthusiasm for it, and that's when I really picked up with Stephen and his go-kart racing because I was enjoying that more than I was my own actual racing. You know, and, and if Brian Callahan had probably not come along, I don't know where the racing um, career would have gone because, you know, he, being a, a fierce competitor at, at Liverpool, could always see that my car presentation and my um, attention to detail in the car was far superior to anybody else's, but it also made it lift its game and made me lift my game to be ultra-competitive. So, you know, he, you know, he threw me a lifeline of sort of probably keeping me in, in this, you know, going racing. And ironic as it seems, I never won a Marlborough Grand National on the asphalt when I was the hot favourite, um, but I won one on bloody dirt. So how, how does that work? That would have been something else that you and Sammy would have been kindred spirits on is that, um, I don't want to use the word anal, Barry, um, that meticulous presentation uh ray geneve is very much the same over in western australia he was always the same you could always just spot the car in the pits and go wow just look at the time and the effort but sammy is very much meticulous with that whole preparation thing as well so you would have had that in common as well oh yeah and that's why we went you know once he got here and saw our shop and and what the way we went about our business of going racing um said we're a lot long long lost brothers yeah. <laughs> you know but uh and, and later, you know, I can tell you about, you know, Sammy coming to, to work for me in America on drive days and the, the fun that we we had, you know, with the association that we got started here, basically at the farm. Now, you built a, a small-scale Liverpool on your, on your property. You've got this beautiful little, to scale, I imagine, um, Asheville Oval, Yet you didn't build a small Bathurst. You didn't build a small Calder Park Thunderdome. You didn't build, build a small Lakeside. So clearly Liverpool did have some special. That The Speedway part of you is clearly more important, Barry. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, oh, no. And and that's, 
one hundred percent correct, Wade. Like that, that that Liverpool. You know what I learnt last Saturday night. I could put into action for next Saturday night. Yeah. If I wanted to go to Canberra on Sunday afternoon, we either left after Liverpool or you know. And as the years of Speedway have unfolded in Australia, it's very unfair to say, look at these guys out here and they're going to learn how to drive. They can't because the apprenticeship now would be so long where in in my time at the Speedway, yeah. if I wanted to, I, I could run 30 or 40 times a year. And so you learnt your trade pretty quickly you know, and, and not only learnt the trade but learnt in the driving side of it but in the car development side of it, how how to make that car work. And, you know, I've seen, like, great drive Rick Hunter and Peter Crick and, you know, yeah. Johnny Gale, those guys that on the dirt at Liverpool, they were great drivers. And then when the asphalt swing come, they didn't quite grasp the whole concept as, as quick as what I did. You know, yep. and I don't know whether it's luck, good management or whatever, but, you know, I got on onto the right track of what the car's required and as long as you've done your maintenance and got everything right, the chances of you winning were fairly high. Barry, you had another um, American that worked for you at RPDE that had an amazing profile in American um, super sedan or saloon car and grand national racing uh, over here in Australia as well, didn't you? Some guy called Rodney Combs worked for you? Yeah, Rodney was um, one of the, the reasons that I got to be able to go to America and learn the trade. This is back in the, the Liverpool days yep. that he'd become part of the travelling American group. Um, he recognised somewhat my ability with the cars. Yep. Um, you know, offered me to come and spend some time with him in America um, to bring the more modern chassis design to us to Australia. Um, so through his introductions, I got to go and spend time with Ed Howe, who at, in those early days was a great fabricator of race cars. Yeah. Um, Rodney's own business in Lost Creek, West Virginia, building his WRC cars. And he, Eventually, we brought that to Australia um, as far as building the cars of Formula Engineering. Um, David O'Callaghan, who was instrumental in the um, first assault of the Americans here, he was involved with Better Brakes, and oh, yeah. they were the original sponsors of the, of the mm -hmm. Vegas. And, you know, so... It, it just sort of all started to unravel and the, the, the more involved or the harder I thought about it and the harder I worked on it, the more results we would have. Were you ever a NASCAR fan, Barry, before before the Bob Jane stuff? Did you show much of an interest in that side of racing before it came to Australia? Yes, I did. I, I, I'd, I'd follow it and mainly because Rodney was trying to break into the NASCAR racing. Um, yeah. he, he was getting a few drives because of his his talent on as a dirt racer. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I followed it, and um, I have a letter somewhere that um, Mike Raymond introduction trying to get me a drive at... Yeah. Um, at Daytona, which I'm glad never happened because I've never seen Daytona in real life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, there was there was always a, an interest there. And it must have been it must have felt like forever from when they basically started that idea when the word got around that Bob James is thinking about building Calder to when it actually happened. Did it take a long time? Are you invested right from the start that if this happens, this is where I'm going? Well. I wanted to, and that's where, when we get into our interviews later about the Thunderdome days, you know, I went down and spoke to Bob, and, you know, I think 
anyone that knows Bob Jane, you've got to admire the guy yeah. for what he tried to build there. But to try and work with him was absolutely painful. And, yeah. you know, I hate speaking badly about it. But, you know, I told people I admire him from what he'd done and I despise him for the way that he went about trying to do it. Yeah. The um the late model stuff as well, because was it Mike Raymond that sort of got was part of that whole late model NASCAR concept that he was working on as well? Did that sort of happen hand in glove at the same time? No, not really. Not not at the same time. Um, you know, the 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 early first two races that Bob put on with a million dollar purse, yeah, you know, that bought the bought the Americans out. Um, yeah, you know, and it bought, you know, what I call Bob's road racing fraternity. Yes. You know, he, um, he organised a car for, for Gary Rush being a Speedway guy. Yep. Um, you know, for Alan Grice and, you know, the, these guys. And that's what, you know, I always wanted to be able to tell this story, but... <laughs> I think we can get into that later about yeah. how all that unfolded and, and yeah, why, sure. the, why yeah. those guys struggled. Yeah. It sounds a bit like an IROC kind of idea. You know how they had that IROC series in America where you had a guy from sprint cars, you had a guy from drags, and they all were in the same cars and things like that. So it, at what point are we up to where you're you're starting to work on Stephen's carts and things like that? Are we talking about late 80s here, early 80s? Late 80s. Stephen started his go-kart racing probably about 88. Okay. Memory. Um, no, not, sorry, not his go-kart racing. That's his midget racing started. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, his, well, his go-kart racing as a junior, um, you know, from sort of 12, 14. Um, yeah. And he said we, we used to travel all the different New South Wales and Queensland circuits and, you know, there'd be my wife and I and young men and mum and dad in the, the van and... Yep. So, you know, the, it's funny, I was having this discussion with Stephen on the weekend about a, a timeline when, you know, it, it's hard to, um, you know, grab... the the concept of time, like, yeah, yeah we're, we're having a bit of a, a magazine clean up here and I pulled out an old magazine that I looked at and it, it was um, the AGP, you know, and it had a list of the, the winners and that that's, it was for the 1991 AGP at Sydney Showground. Yeah. And uh, on the inside front car, a list of the winners and I looking through and I thought, oh, my name's in. I looked at that bloody 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it, it's, and seeing really that where I struggle is like a lot of people stop racing. Right? I really never stopped. Yeah. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Even, even till today, you know, so I got, I wasn't racing but I got the legends cars out, and I, I we got three of them. I run run each one to see how they were performing, and it's yeah. And if we weren't in this lockdown last week, I would have been at Wakefield Park with the BMW having a slide round, and then the following weekend I would have been in Illabay with the dirt track midget. So yeah, yeah. Before um before we wrap up this particular chapter of what we're talking about, I want to touch on Stephen briefly, but I want to talk in future chats we have more about him. But it would seem relatively inevitable, um, Barry, that he will finish as the winningest driver at Parramatta City Raceway ever, um, given the uncertain future of the venue and, and where that's all headed. Um, you must be incredibly proud to think, you know, that, that circuit has bred so much incredible speed car talent over the years. And Stephen has the record for the most amount of A-main wins there. Oh, it is. And, you know, again, you you got to pinch yourself and say, you know, when you look at the next closest numbers, nearly only half of what, <laughs> what is one. Yeah. So how, how did that happen? And, 
I think how it's happened is through what we're saying before. You know, he was a pretty good race car driver, but he made sure he had pretty good bloody race cars too. You know, yeah. The things, and probably the most pleasing thing in all that way is a lot of that success come after Kay and I was spending more and more time in America and he was still working at Qantas. Okay, yeah, yeah. He had to do all the preparation and himself and he didn't have that sort of um, guidance which a lot of people want to give me credit for, but it was his own guidance yeah. that, that got him there. Yeah. I was very fortunate, Barry, to come from, you know, to come from Claremont, which was the king of of speed car racing in Australia in that in that eighties into the early nineties, mid nineties period where it was just ridiculously good. To then after a couple of years come to Sydney and Newcastle where it was just ridiculously good. You know, the, at the risk of leaving people out, Stephen, the Jenkins boys, um, Adam Clark, Craig Brady, Jason Gates, Rod Bowen, Brett Morris, Adrian Ma, like you just go through this massive range of incredible talent so i went from wa to sydney i don't think i'd ever seen it any stronger compared to wa for that for the modern era i'm not talking about the showground days but geez it was tough at Parramatta and newcastle those nights in that late 90s wasn't it oh yes yeah and you know and that's what again if as a driver if you can keep your nose clean and your stuff stays good and you're there at the end right you know, the old thing, it's never won in the first lap. You know, yeah. You know, uh, and just then run them down and, you, you know, the success will come. You know, and uh, I've, I've, I wasn't at Claremont to see him have some great races there with Neville Lance. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, but, you know, I enjoy the the travel side of, of the midget racing as well. Yeah. Um, you know, really enjoyed, you know, my time with going to Perth. You know, and I've, I've got a, a long uh, standing relationship and friendship with a, a wing nut from over there that you probably know who I'm talking about. That, that you know, it, it just, it shows me what, what a sport and, and it worries me, Wade, that, as the years unfold and the modern era of our racing, are those relationships going to still occur? Like, you know, John and Jan and Fenton are great, great friends, you know, and yep. we're talking 45 years. Yeah. Like, uh, and and not just out, but, I mean, continuous. Uh, uh, you know, there wasn't a, an Australian title that Steve, when Stephen started that, that Johnny missed. Yeah. You know, he'd, he'd travel anywhere in Australia to yeah. go and watch the Australian you know, midget title or speed yeah. car title. <laughs> yeah. I knew you'd come back to a speed car eventually. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it, it, you know, I don't know what, what your thoughts on that are. That, you know, it, it seems that, you know, those people that you met you seem to have a bond yeah yeah i think we had more time then barry to be honest we weren't looking at our phones in the pits we weren't you know focusing on on different things back then i think we we're just in it for the moment and i'm really glad that you said that because i think i'm probably i'm looking at everything right now with this covid stuff at trying to um, trying to find some sort of silver lining. And the only silver lining I can find is it's bringing us back to basics, Barry. It's bringing us back to focusing on family, um, focusing on on things that um, are most important, which are not the passing technologies. They're not the things that absorb our time all day, every day, that effectively are just bullshit. Where you're sitting right now in your home, in your workshop, you're surrounded by your family and no one's got anything to do but to be around each other. There's nowhere else to be right now. It's all taken out of our hands. So I'm grateful for that I can recall standing in the pits in turn three with you at Claremont. I'm grateful that I can remember seeing a gold piano up in a VIP room at Charlotte Motor Speedway. I'm, I'm grateful for those moments. And if we're not grateful for this, Barry, and God knows there's people losing businesses, there's people losing loved ones and all that stuff, I'm not taking that away. But it makes me more grateful of the things I've done in my life to this point 
more than anything else. And I, you know, that's part of yeah. hearing your story makes me feel the same way. And I echo those sentiments, Wade. You know that no one's in a hurry to rush off anywhere because they can't rush off anywhere. So yeah. hopefully that'll bring us all all back a, a you know a step. You know, yeah. and, and the same from the business point of view. Everybody's in a hurry to get the job done, charge as much money as they can, make as much money as they can. You know, I think there's more to life than that. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait to talk to you about all those other things, Barry. Thanks so much for your time today. This is only part one. My God, you and I can call this the Graham Chronicles. We could talk six or seven episodes about all the incredible things you've done in your life, but I'm grateful for your grandkids setting up the technology. That's a good start because otherwise you wouldn't know how to do this. Um, and um, can't wait to talk to you about the rest of the stuff. Please give my love to everybody. I'm sure they're sitting there listening to Granddad BS at the moment. No, no, they all, I don't know. I hope they're out mowing the lawns. <laughs> it's good to talk to you, Baz. All right, Wade. Pleasure. Talk to you too, mate. I'm just going to hit stop.